I was very devoted to the works of George Bernard Shaw and in one of his prefaces to when he wrote, they published some of his criticism, he wrote uh, that more people went to the theater in London in the, in the 1890s when he wrote criticism than went to church. This would be a very good thing if the theater took itself seriously as a factory of thought an armory against despair and dullness, an elucidator of social conduct, and a temple for the ascent of man. Well, I was very open to being inspired at that time, and I still am, and that inspired me. So I began to think, what can I do? And I thought, well, I can start a theater where I'm only doing plays that uh, would, be, it would be a waste if they weren't done, but yet they're not going to be done because they're not commercial. They're not going to make money on Broadway. A man came to me and he said, uh, listen, he said, I'm an Episcopal priest. And he was wearing his collar. And he, he said, uh, you want to do in the theater what I, I'm doing in religion. I had a church in St. Croix where I experimented with the arts. We ought to combine. And... Uh, he, he said, I know of an, a church that's not being used in Hell's Kitchen in New York City on the West 46th Street called St. Clement's. I'm going to try to get that. It turns out he was also related to Tennessee Williams because his name was Sidney Lanier. And Sidney Lanier is a famous poet from the South. And <clears throat> Tennessee Williams' real name was Thomas Lanier Williams. He was the Lanier. And he, he and Sidney were friendly. And so uh, the idea was, we, Sidney said, we might be able to get St. Clement's Church. That, uh, and we, I'll, it could be my church, and uh, I'll be a mission to the arts, and we'll be host to the American. I had a name for it. I was very influenced by Alfred, Alfred Stieglitz, who had an American place from about 1917 on, uh, which he only showed American artists and to do something about American artists. And I wanted to do something about American writers, right, who were seriously writing for the theater. Well, in order to get St. Clement's Church, I had to uh, speak to people from the diocese, the Episcopal Diocese in New York City, and an interview was arranged for with a bishop, Bishop Corrigan. And Bishop Corrigan was the home bishop, and that was, he was the bishop for the outlying areas. This was, now we're in 1961, 62 period. So I went to the diocese headquarters and met with Bishop Corrigan. And I really hit it off with him. He knew all about Alfred Stieglitz. And I was, he said, but I want to know one thing. Is what you want to do really needed? Well, that was my stuff. Yes, it's really needed. Because that's the question that I had been asking myself all this time. What is needed? So I was very full in responding to why, what I wanted to do in the theater and with the American Place Theater at St. Clement's Church, that's what we would do. Well, Sam Shepard, uh, I went to see a play of his that went, ran about 25 minutes. It was called Red Cross at Judson Church. That was the only, uh, see St. Clement's was very early in being a church that started to get used as a theater. While they kept the church services, by the way. Uh, and, and I saw it uh, and I felt he was very talented and I said you know I'd like to see your work more of your plays and he, so he came to, to me with La Turista which uh, it was a three act play at that time and we talked about it and then he, he I made some points to him I didn't think he would make radical changes but he said, no, I'm throwing everything out except the first act. So I said, we're going into rehearsal. Well, the 
we were in rehearsal while he's writing the second act. And, uh, and uh, I see him banging the drums around the church all day. I said, when are you writing? Um, we we got to have a second act and you're uh, writing all day, uh, right, banging the drums all day. I said, I write it late at night, which he did. And the play was brilliant. And I did uh, several of his plays after that. And he... It, it, after that, we did have critics, and uh, some of them were very hostile because his plays were not uh, fitting into conformist kind of theater. And uh, some of the critics didn't like him at all. The One of them, I think he was at the Daily News. Oh, by that time I had a theater in the, uh, in, the ba in the basement, in the underground. My theater moved from St. Clement's to... Uh, a theater that was mostly below ground, under a skyscraper. Um, and he said, fill that hole up with ashes and seal it. He was so angry. But right after that, Sam won the Pulitzer Prize for Buried Child. So he now became, a, not establishment, but he was accepted. And what I had wanted, what I who did my theater for was to get his kind of theater, new theater, original kind of dramas that didn't follow the old formula uh, into the circulation of American theater. And there you are, Barry Child getting a Pulitzer Prize. Well, some of the actors uh, who uh, worked at my theater, I knew from my classes and they were damn good. For example, one of the leads in The Old Glory, the first production, was Frank Langella, who was a young actor who was in my class, and I thought he'd be very right. It's Captain Benito uh, Serino. And uh, so he auditioned, and it made me feel good when uh, Robert Lowell turned around, turned to me and said, yes. And, and Frank, uh, Frank talks about it, about how, he, he, this is an audition. And I said, Frank, you have the part. He couldn't believe it. He just auditioned and got the, he was that good. Uh, Joel Gray was my student and he was in the second play in Harry Noonan Night. And Joel Gray went on to fame, uh, cabaret, won Oscar, Tonys, etc. Uh, I did a Sam Shepard play, uh, um, as part of a whole evening called Killer's Head, and I had a young student I thought would be terrific in it, and he was, Richard Gere. That's what literature in a life does. It whets the appetite for reading because it gives them an hour experience with a book that's a prose book, which I take and adapt, only adapt by excerpting from the book but using only the author's words, because their words are better than mine would ever be. And using the author's words, and to go back to what Sanford Meisner taught me, it's organic. It's they, to get the actors to inhabit the roles to the degree where they are really living the roles. And by living the roles, they are magnetizing the audience. The audience gets caught up with the real experience. And not only do they live the role of the protagonist, but of every other character that they, and that's in the adaptation. We call it an adaptation, I call it that. But it's a way of taking a book and using excerpts from it and drama, putting them in a ju dramatic juxtapositions that bring out theater and uh, only using the words of the audience. I, what I do do is I put it into the, the present tense because drama is in the present tense. This is not staying books, novels are back in the past tense. I put them in the present tense and also uh, use the first person, I. So uh, when, when we begin the play, the book we're doing here in Nantucket, uh, 
uh, on Sunday night is the things they carry. He introduces himself. I'm Tim O'Brien. I'm him. and this is he's telling he's so he grabs you. This is his story of the, the, his experience as a Vietnam soldier. Well, we began literature to life in 1992 with uh, Tony Morrison's book, The Bluest Eye. And then we did Black Boy by Richard Watt, right? And around this time, I began to think, I've, uh, I've created a form of theater which is unique, and it's my creation. And I'm very pleased with, with the value of it how valuable it is. Then I realized that William Shakespeare, who knew everything, said it all, what I was doing, he knew, and he wrote about it in the prologue to Henry V, when he had to have, have the, the audience is gonna be watching the battles on the stage. He, he wrote, he gave the the chorus who introduces the play, Henry V, these words. On your imaginary forces work. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping all times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. Well, the wit supply admit me chorus. And so he even said the hour. So I'm doing the literature of life and runs an hour. This is permitted. It's all in an hourglass. I can give you this.